All right, welcome everybody to today's phase two lecture on the terminal advanced module and all things nerdy and terminal terminally. Um, yeah, I'm going to just be walking through uh, some like how to use the terminal things, good stuff to know, all content that's sort of uh, part of the terminal advanced module in phase two, but uh, will probably also be applicable to people who are maybe in phase one or phase three, if you've wandered in from there, welcome. Um, <clears throat> and uh, please stop and ask questions and divert me down rabbit trails if there's other things you're interested in, ancillary to what I'm talking about, uh, or if you just want clarification. Um, and you can uh, just unmute yourself and ask a question out loud or type a question in the Zoom chat. I will do my best to keep that open and keep an eye on it. Uh, so let's get started. Um, for reference, I'm just going to paste this into the chat. This is the module that uh, sort of relevant to what we're doing today. Um, and I've got a terminal window open here. Um, I'm actually going to, yeah. And so um, let's start with some basics, uh, just to kind of introduce some terminology to make sure we're all calling the same thing, the same things. Uh, so uh, I've got my terminal open here. You're all familiar with this. Uh, the little dollar sign here, my prompt. And uh, the stuff we type into the terminal is uh, command. So commands you guys are familiar with is gonna be something like ls. Um, and since there's nothing in this directory that I'm in, uh, ls doesn't return anything, but that would give us a list of files. Um, if we do ls slash to list the root, right? Um, so ls is the, um, What's happening here when we type this command is we're basically telling Bash, I want to run a program on this computer. And we name the program ls, and then we pass it any number of uh, arguments. And uh, it runs that program for us. And so uh, what's happening here, yeah, it may be a little bit subtle, um, the, what Bash is doing is it's taking that uh, ls command and it's telling the operating system, okay, please go and run the ls program with the following arguments. Uh, and uh, so Bash sort of like steps aside and runs ls and then when ls is done running, Bash sort of comes back and gives you another prompt uh, to issue another command. So bash is sort of a process that's running in your computer and then it sort of spawns off. It starts this LS process, runs it to completion, um, and then comes back to ask you, you know, what do you want to do next? So the thing that's happening here while this stuff is being spit out is, is a process. Um, and a process is like a good definition for a process is an instance of a program running in a computer. So LS is a program, right? It's a bunch of code that's sitting on our file system somewhere. In fact, uh, if we type which LS, it'll actually show us where that program lives. It lives in slash bin slash LS. So there's this file in this bin directory in our computer that has a bunch of compiled code in it called LS. Um, when we launch that process, or when we tell Bash to start the LS process, it takes all that code from that file and it loads it up into memory and then it starts feeding it to the processor one, one basically line of code at a time and it runs through that file. Um, so that's what all these, whenever you're typing stuff into the bash terminal, you're actually like running other programs. Um, and that's the same way that your programs will get run eventually when you're running like node or programs written in any other language. So, um, and if you've done the terminal basics from phase one, you're familiar with the idea that each process has a, a process ID number or a PID. And if we use the PS command, it'll show us sort of the processes that we own and that we're running and what their process IDs are. Um, so I've got a bunch of different like terminals open. I've got 
Vim. I've got my editor open in another window with the notes for this lecture. You can see that running there. So processes have a, a process ID to kind of keep them straight, which one's which. Um, and then, uh, and I'm talking a lot about processes because Bash is basically a utility to help us like start and manage processes, right? Which you can kind of think of as commands. Um, and so how do I talk to one of these processes? So for instance, um, uh, ls slash, right? Um, so this process is running and ls when you run it, like it's very short. That program was running for like a fraction of a second and then ended. Uh, but you can imagine, you know, a lot of programs run for a lot longer than that. And we, we want to have a way um, in either case, in short running programs or long running programs, we need a way to communicate to the process um, and like be communicated to from the process. And there's a couple ways that we do that. One is just command line arguments, which you should all be familiar with, right? So if I type ls with no arguments, it just lists the current directory, but I can communicate to the process by adding arguments and saying, uh, you know, slash, and then it'll list that directory, or I can tell it to list my uh, home directory. Um, so that's a way to sort of like communicate to the process by passing in stuff at the beginning that sort of becomes part of the application's state as it's running. Um, and then uh, the process has a couple of different ways of communicating while it's running. Um, and uh, one of the primary of those ways is uh, by file handles. So processes can write to and read from files. And you've probably done some of that if you've done some of the, um, if you've done like a phase two command line to-do list where you're like reading and writing JSON to a file. Um, so that's sort of a way for a process to communicate with the outside world by reading to and writing from a file. And it turns out that every process when it starts in a, a sort of a Unix environment, and this is very it's similar, almost identical in, in a Windows environment, every process when it starts has three files already open. <laughs> Uh, one that it's reading from, and two that it can write to. Um, and, uh, but they're, they're sort of like special files. They don't actually correspond with a file on your file system. They're just sort of pipes that, they can, that the process can read data from or write data to. Uh, and those are called uh, standard in, standard out, and standard error. So all this stuff that gets printed out when LS runs, is called standard out. And you'll often see it written this way as an abbreviation, standard out. And it's just sort of the standard output of a process. So in a node process, when you console.log, you're actually writing to that standard out stream. Um, and then there is also a standard in stream that a process uh, kind of reads to, reads from by default, which is a way to send data to a process. So um, let's, let's see how this would look like uh, with some uh, sort of built-in Unix commands. Um, so for example, uh, say we have this, uh, I'm gonna ls, do, 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 what's a good example? Let's list the, uh, so in my home directory, I've got an LG directory and then curriculum. I have the curriculum checked out. So if I do a listing of that file, and let's look at, yeah, okay. So I can do a listing of that folder, and I'm gonna add a dash L flag to my ls command, which is just give me, give me a long listing, which will list every file or directory in that directory one per line, and give me some other data about it. So um, gives me the, the time it was created, and who owns it, and a bunch of other information. Um, but the nice thing about dash L is it just, it gives it to me everything. Uh, each line contains a signal result. So LS is sort of printing all this to standard out. Um, there are a lot of programs that uh, are built to read from standard in uh, and do something with the data that's coming in. So uh, grep is an example of that. Um, 
grep will sort of read from the standard input and uh, filter it and only print out lines that match a given string. So for instance, um, I can say grep uh, Trevor, my name. And if I start this program, uh, you'll notice I hit enter, I'm down on the next line and grep is just running. It's just waiting for me to type something. It's just waiting for data to come in on standard input, which by default is just me typing in the terminal. So I could type, uh, start typing names. Uh, and if I type my name, what grep will do is it'll read that in from standard input and then it'll print it back out to standard output. So you see, I get my name in there twice from the time that I typed it and uh, from grep actually writing it back out to standard out. Um, and it'll do partial matches, right? If that appears anywhere on the line. So that's not super useful in that case, um, but it's leading to this cool thing, uh, which is um, I can, I can stitch these two programs together by using this special pipe operator in the shell. So what I can do is I can say, I want to run this ls command, and then I want to send its standard output. Instead of printing to the screen, which is what happens by default, I want to send its standard output into the standard input of the next command. So I can send all of this data here directly into a grep command. And that would allow me, for instance, to search for JavaScript files. So now I get the same listing that came out from the ls-l command, but it's filtered out all of the lines that don't have a .js in them somewhere. So now I'm just seeing the JavaScript files that are at the top level of the curriculum directory and JSON files, since they have a .js in them too. Um, so what the pipe is doing there is it's taking the output of one command and it's sort of feeding it into the input of another command. Um, and this is something that's this really powerful aspect of the bash shell or other shells is the ability to stitch together different commands to do something a lot more powerful. Um, and this is like sort of core to the sort of Unix Linux philosophy of like have a lot of like simple tools that have like these defined interfaces, standard input, standard output, so that you can sort of compose them together. Um, so that's ls and grep and the pipe character. Um, let me find where we are. So, um, so some other cool things you can do with this. Um, instead of piping to a file, you can use the greater than sign to redirect standard output into a file. You can think of that like uh, greater than sign as like a, like a um, funnel, right? So I could put that listing and I could call this listing.txt. I can just name some file, doesn't have to exist already. Um, and so now if I do a listing of the current directory, we'll see I have this new listing.txt file. And if we open that, Let me move this over here, open it in another window. If we open it, we see it's got that uh, output from the ls command in a file. Um, so uh, that's the greater than operator. Um, so pipe will send the output like to another command and the greater than will send the output into another um, into another, into a file. And then you can do this the other way around too. Now that we have listing in a file, uh, we can use it, we can push, the, push a file into the standard input of a command. So we have that grep command where we're looking for .js. We can use the less than sign to take the like, the data that's in that listing file and push it into the input of this grep command to grep through uh, the contents of that file. Um, and like we could change it, look for markdown files, get the markdown files. Does that make sense? Questions? I see a question in the chat that I missed. Uh, is when it 
pipes to grep uses the dash one option even though it is not in the command. Jonathan, can you L S not that's that's oh. this word is L S not is <laughs> even though you can't tell the difference. Right. Yes, yes, that's true. Yeah. So some commands will will notice when their output is being redirected and they'll actually use different formats. Um, and ls is an example of that. So if I just type ls in the terminal, it sort of you know prints this multiple things line. But if I uh, if I pipe that output into something else, or if I redirect it into a file, uh, and then I use cat to print out the contents of that file, you'll see that the file actually has all these things on you know one per line, um, and that's ls is sort of altering its behavior a little bit when it realizes that its output is being redirected to a file and not being printed out to display directly to the user. Um, and that's not uncommon. And basically that's because if you're, if you're sort of redirecting the output, it's probably because you're going to want to do something programmatic to it. And it's just a lot easier to parse this output if it's one entry per line than if it's this like formatted tabulated table of results. Um, so, that is piping and redirection. So I said that there were two files that processes uh, write to, or two pipes that they, they write out to. There's standard out, which is what we've been looking at. That's what LS does by default. Um, and there is something called standard error. Uh, and Standard error is another way that processes write data out. And in the terminal, you'll just see it show up in the, in, in the, uh, just in the terminal, it'll just get printed out. Uh, but it is, um, it goes to a different uh, pipe. So you can, you can treat it separately. You can treat like the error message that messages that come out of a program differently than it's like normal output. And we'll see an example of that in a little bit when we start writing our own uh, shell script. But I'm going to gloss over that for right now. We'll get back to standard error in a minute. Um, but while we've got these tools, this pipe and the greater than and less than signs, I'm going to go through some of the other of the commands that are part of this terminal advanced module and kind of show you how uh, you might use some of them to work with the standard in and standard out as well. So going back to our, um, I'm gonna do something different. So let's say we want to, I'm gonna change directory and go into the checkout of the curriculum repository. And then uh, I'm gonna look at something like uh, the readme. That's not super interesting. Let's look at the modules. There's a readme in here, if I can spell readme right. There we go. It's a bit longer of a file. Okay, so we've got this readme here. Um, so we've already seen, uh, we've already seen rep. Uh, and so we could, there's a, like an FAQ in this file. We could like grep for uh, questions from the FAQ, for example. Um, and what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm using the cat command, which just prints out a file to standard out, and I'm piping that into grep. Uh, the other thing to know about grep is that if it doesn't, if nothing, if you specify a uh, uh, file as the first argument to grep, if I can do this, read me. Um, then it just uses the contents of that file to, to search through and it ignores the standard input. Um, so you can do it all in, in one command there. If you do it in the right order, sorry. The thing you're searching for goes first, then the file name. Um, ah, okay, so someone's asking about, uh, they tried to use, uh, let me move this over here so you can see it. Tried to use using grep a thing less than new file.txt and bash tells me no such file or directory. Um, so uh, when you're specifying a file as input, that file has to already exist. 
Um, it's when you're specifying a file as the destination for output that the file doesn't have to exist yet. Uh, in that case, Bash will create the file and then write into it. But if you're using a file as input, the file does actually have to exist first. Uh, so that's why you're getting that um, error. Does that make sense? So back to where we're here. We got this uh, readme here. So other interesting commands you can do with this are um, there is a uh, WC command, which is really handy. So in this example, let's say what I really want to know is how many questions are in the FAQ in the modules readme. Um, I can do this grep, and it'll filter out for me just the questions. Um, and then I can pipe the output of that command to another command called word count, or WC. WC takes in uh, data on input, reads like lines of text, and then it will print out for you the number of, if I write this command correctly, it'll print out the number of uh, lines, words, and characters in a file. So this is showing us that the file had three lines, 35 words, and 154 characters. So slightly larger than a um, And ask we'll just print them. Um, Trevor? We just get the three in that case. So now we've got sort of this one command that will take a markdown file. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Question? No, you were just breaking up for a second there. So I wanted to let you know in case you. Oh, gotcha. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Um, so I will rewind a little bit. Um, <laughs> so word count, uh, we're piping the output of this grep command, which is those three questions from the FAQ in the readme. We're piping that to a command called word count, uh, which is WC. And WC will by default print out the number of lines, characters, sorry, lines, words, and characters in a file. So, uh, or in the input. So in this case, that's this up here. So this chunk of text has three lines, which we can see 35 characters, 154, sorry, 35 words and 154 characters. And if we add a dash L to the WC command, uh, it will just print out the number of lines. So we get three. Um, so um, you can kind of see how Bash like turns into this programming language where you can think of each of these commands as like a function, and then you can sort of pass the results of one function into the next function. But instead of operating on variables, it's operating on like a stream of data that keeps getting like manipulated or changed in a certain way. Um, so word count can be really handy. Um, this sort of thing where you're like grepping and counting is really handy when you're like looking through error logs on a production server and trying to figure out like, are there any errors? You can grep for errors. Or if you're trying to figure out how many times in the past hour have we had a certain kind of an error, you can sort of uh, grep for that error and then do a WC to count lines. Um, um, and another really handy one is, uh, especially for log files, is tail. So again, if we cat this uh, a file, we get a bunch of results. Um, and uh, tail is a little command that will just take the input and just print out the last 10 lines of it. Um, so it's a quick way to just see the end of something. Um, and uh, that is nice, again, for log files, which always sort of write to the end to just see like, what are the most, you know, the 10 most recent requests to the server or whatever. Uh, tail is handy for that. Um, let's see. So those are mostly the, the interesting ones that have to do with um, input and output from the terminal advance. There's a couple more in here towards the end that are OSX specific. So these aren't uh, just sort of like an Apple uh, utility, but there's uh, PB copy. And PB copy will take its input and then put it in your clipboard, like your command C clipboard. So we do that and we take this, uh, you know, the results of this readme. Um, so we don't get any output, the input, the 
the whole file just went into the pb copy command. And then if we open up a terminal, uh, and I do the mouse, you can see if I paste in here, I've got the whole contents of the file in my paste buffer. Um, another helpful thing is uh, there's the, of course, the, so if I, if I copy, let's copy this here. If I copy some text, I can run pb paste, and it will print out whatever is in my paste buffer. So then I could, you know, pb paste and then pipe that to other commands. Um, so, yeah. Let's see. Um, Jonathan says tail dash F can be useful. Yeah, tail, so tail has some, some neat command line flags and one of them is tail dash F, which will, uh, if you give it a file, it'll watch that file and as more content gets written to the end of that file, it will get printed out. Um, and the command will just sort of stay open waiting for more data to come into the file. Uh, so that is really helpful for, again, for like a server log file that's getting written to as your application runs, you can sort of watch it in real time and then even pipe the results of that into different like grep commands um, to filter through it. So lots to be said about pipes and redirection, but I wanna to get to some of this other fun stuff, um, unless there are more questions about that stuff specifically. All right, um, so, doo -doo -doo. So what if we want to do some of this stuff ourselves? We've been using just like built-in commands here. Um, but let's actually write a, um, let's write our own uh, program to run. Um, oh, and before I gloss over this, CD minus, um, uh, this is something I've learned more recently. CD minus will take you back to whatever directory you were in last. So a while back I said CD tilde LG curriculum to get from my terminal advanced folder to this curriculum folder. And to get back, I can just say CD minus and it'll just change me into whatever my previous directory was. Um, and then you, you can kind of keep doing that to go back and forth between two directories, uh, which saves you a lot of typing. So file that one away. Um, okay, so what if we wanted to write our own uh, our own sort of bash script. Uh, so the, the simple way to do that would be, uh, let's call this hello.txt. No, that sh since it's gonna be a shell script. Um, so we can just open a file and write some commands in here. Echo will print something out for us so we can say hello world. Um, and uh, then maybe we'll just do a listing of my redirectory. Um, so I'm gonna save that file. I'm doing this in VI, which is why it still looks like we're in the terminal, but um, I'm just creating this file, writing that content to it, saving it. So now if we do an LS, we see we have a hello.sh, cat it out and see the contents. And if we were to run that file, uh, we can actually pass it to bash and just say bash hello.sh, just like you do with node. Um, and this will sort of start a new bash process that instead of giving you an interactive prompt, we'll just read commands from the file hello.sh and then exit. Um, so there it is, hello world, and it does the listing. Um, so that's handy. Um, but we kind of always have to like say bash space and then like the script that we run a one, which feels a little wonky, all the other commands we write, we just have to say like ls and it sort of knows where to find it and it runs it and we don't have to specify bash ls or anything weird like that. Um, so let's make this a little better. Uh, it turns out that bash does this really cool thing when you, um, or I guess, uh, yeah, when you invoke a command, uh, it goes and finds the file that you're trying to run and it will look in the file to see if the first line of the file starts with uh, uh, a hashtag and a 
exclamation point. And if it does, it will read the rest of that line and use that as the um, program to run. And it will hand the file itself as the first argument to that program. So uh, what does that mean in practice? It means that if we type bin bash here, which is the location that the bash script lives. Um, and if you're curious about how to find that, you can use the which command. So which, um, which will tell you, will like print out the location of any uh, program in your computer. So anything you can type in, like if I can type, uh, you know, ls, if I say which ls, it'll actually show me where that ls program lives, lives in bin. So if I say which bash, it will show me that bash also lives in that top level slash bin directory. If I go back into hello.sh and I type bin bash up here, um, uh, then I can program hello.sh um, just by Giving, the, giving a relative path to it, which in this case, since I'm in the same directory, is just dot the current directory slash hello. Um, the first time I do that, though, I'm going to get this permission denied error because the operating system will not let me run a file as a program unless uh, the file's permissions explicitly allow that. So let's take a minute to talk about file permissions. Um, so. Uh, every file in a Unix file system has a series of permissions. Uh, you can allow reading, writing, and executing of a file, or none of the above, or any combination of those things. Um, and you can uh, you can set those permissions for uh, the owner of the file, and then the group of the file, and then just sort of globally. So you could allow an owner of a file to read a file, for example, and nobody else to. Or you could allow the owner to modify the file and everyone else just to read it. Uh, and if you want to see the permissions, um, if you want to see the permissions of a file, you can use ls to do that. And if you do the long listing in ls, the ls-l, so let's list the current directory. This first line here with these minus signs and letters, those are actually the file permissions. Um, and the way it works is uh, uh, the first column you can just ignore for practical purposes. Um, and then the rest of them, there's sort of like three letters per grouping. So let me, that's the best way to explain this. So, um, the first three characters specify the permissions for the owner of the file. And you can see over here in the long listing, Trevor and staff, that's telling me that the owner of the file is Trevor and the group owner of the file is staff, um, which is probably just like a built-in group in OSX. I'm not sure where that came from. Um, so this is saying that like the owner of the file has read and write permissions. That's what the R and the W are. And this third column here in that first group, this minus sign right here where my cursor is, uh, that's where the execute permission would be. And since there's a minus sign there, it shows me that I don't have execute permission, even though I created the file. By default, the file gets created with no execute permissions for anybody. And then the next three letters would be the permissions for the group, which we see are just read and nothing else. And the final three are the permissions for uh, everybody, regardless of your role or group or whatever. Um, and we see they just have read permissions too. So to, to execute this file using just the you know, dot slash hello jargon, uh, I have to change the uh, permissions of this file. And it turns out there is a command for that too called change mode. Uh, chmod, chmod, and chmod, uh, to add or remove a permission, you can just say plus, and then the letter that represents that permission. Uh, so for execute, it would be x, and then the name of the file. So if I say chmod plus x, hello.sh, it'll add execute permissions to that file. And if we do the listing again, we'll see that now everybody has been given execute permissions on the file. 
And it shows up a different color here in the listing because it's executable. Uh, if we wanted to take away those permissions, we just change the plus to a minus in the command, minus x. We'll remove execute permissions from everybody, so they're gone. And if I just wanted to add execute permissions for the user, I would say u plus x, user plus x, user gets executable permissions. Um, and you see I just get the x there just for me. Um, most of the time, if I'm making a file executable because I'm, I'm writing a script, I just use the plus x, just make it executable for, for everyone. Um, it's usually safe to do by default. Um, All right, uh, so there's a question in the chat about which versus where is. I'm actually not super familiar with where is. Um, so I'm, checks the standard binary directories for the specified programs printing out the past and finds any. It sounds very similar, so I'm actually not sure. It may be another program that does effectively the same thing, which is just the one that I'm used to using. Um, so I'm not sure if there's uh, significant differences between those two. Um, so, uh, so we've made this thing executable, and so now we can run it this way, and just by typing dot slash hello dot sh, um, uh, we can run it without having to specify bash. Um, and that seems like a lot of work, but it's going to pay off. So uh, the fun thing about this is uh, it works for any program, not just Bash. So doing dot slash hello dot sh is going to, uh, it's going to look in the file, Bash is going to look in the file, see that the first line has a, what's called a shebang line, that pound exclamation point. Right, it's going to find this as the first line, and it's going to say, oh, this is the program I need to run. So it actually runs this program, it runs bash, and then it passes this file's file name as the first argument to bash, uh, which is the same as typing bash hello world, right? But using that same logic, we could create a hello.javascript file. Um, and if we know where node lives, which we can find out by saying which node, so there's a full path to my node executable, right, and copy that. And then I can look in hello.sh, and I can use that as a shebang line. And then, uh, now I can just write JavaScript in here. Uh, and if I save that, and then make it executable, hello.javascript. So now I can use, I can run that JavaScript just like it was a shell script. Um, and bash will just look in the file and find out, oh, that's a, that's a JavaScript file. I need to use this node thing to run it. Um, so you can actually write little shell script helpers for yourself in JavaScript um, and run it with node that way. So, um, All right, so a couple other things I want to talk about before we run out of time. Unless there are, are there more other questions about this stuff, file permissions, uh, that sort of thing? Let's see, did you put that into the JavaScript file directly, or is there a place where we can do that for all JavaScript files? Ah, no, I put that in the, I put that in the file directly. Yeah, so when you, when you run a uh, command like this, the extension of the file um, isn't really, is not used in determining how the file should be executed. It's just ignored. So you do have to add, um, you have to add a, what's called a shebang line at the beginning for this to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's not a way to kind of set that in bash as the default for any file type. They actually, you have to be explicit. Um, and add the shebang line. And you'll notice that this first line is not valid JavaScript. However, Node, um, to sort of support this functionality, Node will just ignore the first line of a file 
uh, when it, um, if it starts with this shebang, if it starts with this hash exclamation point, Node will just ignore that line and move on to the rest of it. So you won't get a syntax error trying to run this file with Node. Um, okay, someone's asking about control R and file, and I can totally talk about those, yes. Um, so control R is a way to, so I've been typing a bunch of commands here. Um, and uh, for instance, if I want to remember like, oh, I know I just typed the command to chmod a file, but I forget exactly what it was. I don't want to type the whole thing out again. I can use the up arrow to kind of search back through my history until I find the one I want. Like, oh, there it is. Um, or I can hit control R. And control R will then change my prompt into this reverse dash I dash search. Um, uh, and what that's prompting me to do is just start typing in uh, part of the command I'm looking for. And it will sort of auto complete for me. So if I start typing C H M, uh, you can see it's, it's showing me to the right here, the command, my most recent command that contains that string that I'm typing. Um, and as soon as I've got the right command there, I can hit enter and it'll just execute that command. Uh, so command R is a way to just like search back through commands that you've typed. And it'll search back through your whole um, bash history. So I actually use this just for like things that I type a lot. Uh, I'll use command R because I know it's in my history somewhere. Um, so for instance, like a while back, I did that CD command to the curriculum directory. So I could just type control R and then C-U-R, start typing curriculum and there's that CD command. And now I don't have to type out the rest of it. I just type those four characters and back. Um, and CD minus to go back to where I started. Uh, so that's control R, super helpful. Save you a lot of time typing. And the file command, just uh, you pass it a file name and it'll tell you what kind of file it is. So if I pass it this hello.js, it'll show me that uh, it is a uh, text executable. And it actually prints out, see it's printing out, uh, it looks like it got truncated, but it's printing out the first so many characters of the shebang line to show me like what file it is. Not just that it's a, text executable, but like which uh, interpreter is going to be used to execute it. So if we look at cello.sh, it's also a text executable, but it recognizes that bin bash um, shebang line and tells me it's a born again shell script. Uh, and you could point this at a directory and it'll tell you that it's a directory. Um, so that's what file is. Honestly, I can't remember the last time I used file uh, for any reason, um, but it's in, it's in the terminal advanced skill list. Um, and I'm sure I mean, it can be helpful to know. I think probably the reason I don't use file is the ls l will also show you um, what directories are. And that's actually that first character in this uh, permissions list is going to be a D for directories um, and just a minus sign for files. And so that's usually how I look to see if like something's a file or a directory. Um, but files are another way to do that. And file obviously gives you more information than whether it's just a file or directory. Um, so, um, bum, 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 bum. where did I want to get to? Okay, so fun stuff, job control. So I'm going to go back into this. Now that we have a way to run a node script. Um, do, do, do. Actually, I'm not going to do this in it. I'm going to go back into hello.sh. That's right. Yeah. And I'm going to use copy, which is something you should have learned in Terminal Basics if you've done that already. Uh, copy. I'm going to take this hello.sh and I'm going to make a new script called uh, slow.sh. Um, and now I'm going to open that file and we're going to change it a little bit. So we have this hello world. We're going to say starting. And then we're going to use the sleep command, which does kind of what you would think. You give it a number of seconds and it just does nothing for three seconds and then ends. Uh, and then I'm going to say 
echo a period. And I'm using the dash n flag for echo, which is going to print out that period and then not a new line. Uh, and you'll see why here in a second. And then we're going to sleep for another second. And then I'm going to do that uh, 50 more times, though. There we go. So you can do that a whole bunch of times. Just print a period and then sleep for a second. Uh, let's see. And we're going to check the permissions. It looks like the permissions got copied. This is executable, so I can just say slow. So now I've got a file that is running. And it's still running. And it's going to run for almost a minute. Um, and this is where we get to the second way to communicate with a running process. So we had standard input and standard output. Um, and the other way is sending signals. So one way to send a signal is control C, which will send a signal to the process called a, um, an interrupt signal, which stops it. Um, nope, not typing, right? Control C. There we go. So if I hit control C, not control V, uh, but if I hit control C, it just interrupts that script, right? Sends it a signal saying, hey, stop, and it'll just stop in the middle of whatever it was doing. There's some other con cool control shortcuts um, that actually don't send a signal to the process that's running, but they send a signal to Bash telling it to do things to manage, manage the running process. So one thing I can do is hit Control Z. Uh, what Control Z does is it doesn't stop the program, it just pauses it. Um, it says stopped, which is a little confusing. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't end the program. It just stops it temporarily, which is sort of like pausing it. But if we look at PS, we should see there's that process, slow.sh. It's still here. It's still got a process ID. Um, it's just stuck. It's just hung. Um, and it's, it's suspended its execution. Um, and so and then if I type FG, which stands for foreground, I can bring that most recently stopped process back to the foreground, and it'll pick up where it left off, printing out periods. Um, so I can do this uh, as many times as I want to, right? I can stop it, I can run other commands, and then I can sort of come back to it um, and let it keep going. So, um, why would, why would this be useful? How about an example? So um, I don't, you may or may not have used curl before. Uh, curl is just a, it's an, sort of an HTTP client uh, for just like downloading. You give it a URL and it will just um, uh, download the contents of that URL and print them out. It's, it's, it's C URL for, I think the C is from cat. So it's sort of like catting a file, but you're catting the contents of some URL on the internet. So for instance, if we were to take um, the URL for uh, node version six, this is the URL for downloading node version six, and I could say node six dot pkg. So instead of just printing out the contents of the source code for node six, which would be the compiled source code, so it would be a bunch of binary that would mess up my terminal. I'm going to redirect the output of this curl into uh, a file. And uh, so when I do that, curl sort of prints out this like process meter here, right? Uh, showing me how far along it's come. I'm going to cancel that though and run this again with dash s, which just silences that process meter. So I'm not going to get any output here. And I can, so I could start this download. And this is an example of something that like might take a while and you might all of a sudden be like, huh, I want to do something else. Or I want to see how, um, how far along we've come. So like if I stop the process now and wonder like how much of node six have I downloaded so far, we could do an ls dash l and it'll show us the number of bytes. Uh, that's not super useful unless you can quickly translate bytes into megabytes. Uh, which involves math. Nobody wants to do math. So another useful command that is in the terminal advanced skill list is du. Du stands for disk usage. Um, and uh, that will list out uh, all of the, 
you give it a bunch of arguments. So if I hit star, star is just a shortcut for everything in this directory, right? So it'll print out all those. I can give it uh, node six to be more specific. And if I give it a dash H flag, H for human readable, it'll show me the size in uh, like megabytes or gigabytes or something more readable than this like uh, uh, bytes format here. So I can see that we've gotten nine megs of node six downloaded here. Um, and again, I can foreground to bring it back to the foreground and keep going. Um, so backgrounding and foregrounding can be useful. Another way that I use this a lot in practice is uh, y'all probably noticed that I use this VI editor in the terminal. So I can be in here um, working on hello.js, right? Um, and since VI is just another program that the terminal is running, I can hit Command Z in here and just suspend VI if I want to come back out to the shell and like test out the program that I'm writing. And then I can type foreground to bring VI back to the foreground. And I didn't have to close my editor. It's just a switch, quick way to like kind of switch windows in effect. Um, so that's, I use Control Z a lot there for that. Um, but the neat thing about this is that the bash will keep track of any number of processes that you have like suspended or going. So for instance, I could start, uh, do, 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 I could start downloading node six and then suspend that. And I could start a separate download for, uh, node version eight, just copy this URL, right? So node eight dot package kg I could start that and I could suspend that one as well and if I want to see which processes I have suspended I can type jobs and jobs will print out all the currently running jobs you have in like this bash terminal um, and it'll show me I've got these two jobs and they're both stopped um, and so at this point I've got multiple stop jobs uh, if I use foreground, it's going to foreground the most recently suspended job. Uh, but I can hand it a special argument that starts with a percent and then give it the number of the job I want to start. So if I say foreground percent one, it'll start job number one. Uh, and it sort of prints out the command there so you know which one you started. Uh, similarly, right, I could do foreground job number two and it would start up the node eight job. Um, so this all feels really stupid because um, these things are never going to download if I keep suspending them, uh, which uh, leads to the other cool thing you can do with jobs. You can foreground a job, but you can also background a job. So BG, background, will start a job running again, but it'll start it disconnected from your terminal. So it'll kind of start it in the background, but leave you an interactive terminal that you can use. So I could background number one and number two, and now if I type jobs, we'll see both of those jobs are running. And those files uh, should be getting, if I type the right command, should be getting bigger and bigger. See both of those file sizes are increasing node six and node eight, because those jobs are running in the background. Um, and I can sort of still keep an eye on them with jobs. Um, and now I can see that like the node six one is done and the node two one is still running. Um, so that can, that can be helpful, especially when you're, when you're like firing off long running commands like this or wanting to do stuff in the background and don't want to have like 17 terminal windows open. Um, and let's see, let's see, let's see. Um, that is most of the stuff that I wanted to get to. There's still a few other things here in the, um, the skills map. I'm gonna do one more because we're, we almost got all the way there. So a while back, um, ah, so Jonathan points something out that's very useful. Uh, doing BG to background a job. It backgrounds it, but if you close your terminal, if you kill that bash session and close your terminal, um, it will end up killing that job as well. So it's not gonna run indefinitely in the background if you close your shell altogether. 
um, it is still in that sense kind of connected to your shell. It's just sort of pushed into the background. Uh, that's correct. There are other ways for to run things like Postgres, for example, or like databases are an example of something that runs like in the background, not at all connected to any terminal. So you can close all your terminal windows and like your database isn't going to stop. Um, but there's a little bit more that has to be done to, to disconnect it that far from your terminal. Um, so the one other thing I wanted to show you is the uh, path environment variable. So we've already seen echo. Um, and we can use echo to print out the contents of a variable. So a lot of you probably are familiar with env that prints out all of your environment variables. If you want to print out a specific environment and variable, you usually use something like echo dollar sign and the environment variable name. Um, and bash will take this dollar sign path and it will go look up the path environment variable and it will replace this text with the contents of that variable, and then echo will print that out just like it prints anything out. So your path environment variable is where uh, your shell is going to look when you type in a command that does not start with a relative path or an absolute path. So when I type ls, um, it knows that ls lives in, where did we say it lived? In bin ls, because it actually goes through all of these directories in order, separated by this colon. Um, and somewhere in here is going to be uh, a slash bin. And it's in here somewhere. So many directories. There it is, slash bin's right here. So because bin is in my path, uh, it's one of the directories that gets looked in. Um, so if I wanted to write my own scripts, I could put them in slash bin, but I have to be like the root user to do that, and it can be kind of disruptive. Um, and so what I can do is I can make a directory, uh, my own bin directory. Let's just make one in this folder. So if I move into bin now, I've got this, uh, I've got this directory here. Um, and uh, if I, let's move the hello.sh script into this directory. So now I've got this in my bin directory, and I'll go back up a directory. So now I'm in my terminal advanced directory. I've got a bin directory. Um, and I can change my path to add in this one. And I'm going to change this tilde to be more explicit. I'm going to say users Trevor. So if I want uh, Bash to look in this bin directory while it's looking for things, um, I can just set my path environment variable to be the current path with a colon and this new thing attached to the end of it. Um, and uh, the one tricky thing about setting environment variables like this is that this will work, this like path equals, but it'll only set the environment variable for uh, the current command that you're running. If you want to set this as an environment variable for the like the the bash process you're in, you have to say export uh, to sort of like set it globally. It's another way to think about that. So I do that. I've now changed my path variable. So it has this terminal advanced bin thing on it. And so now I can just type hello.sh like any other command. And it will find it in that bin directory and run it. Um, and uh, Jonathan asks, will export survive the end of the session? And it will not. So if you want to change your path directory, your path environment variable permanently, um, then you have to run this command every time you start a bash shell. And that may seem like a phenomenal amount of work. And it is. But conveniently, there is a file that gets run every time you start a bash shell. And it's called your .bashrc file. So in your home directory, there's a file uh, called .bashrc. You can put any kind of commands in here you want. And this is my bashrc. And you can see I've already got a few things in here that are exporting uh, environment variables. So I've got my prompt that I'm setting, and I'm already changing the path here a couple of times. Um, 
you can see that I'm setting a bin directory in my home directory to in the path. And so I could add this export command that adds, you know, this new bin directory to the path as well. So if you put in your dot bash RC, which gets executed every time bash starts, then you'll like always have a, have that new directory in your path. Um, so bash RC, uh, so Jonathan asks, how does bash RC relate to bash profile? Without getting too involved, primarily because I don't remember all of the details, but um, when you start a terminal, there's, there's this distinction between a login terminal and, uh, a, and another kind of terminal, um, which is a little bit of a holdover from like days where you'd be like remoting into a computer to open up a session remotely, um, or when like there wasn't a GUI interface. And, um, in practice, putting in your bash profile, I think will work a lot of the time. Um, but there are certain instances where your bash profile will not get read. Um, and I, I don't remember all of the details. I would have to Google it again. The, the, the short answer is just always use bash RC. Um, there's usually not a reason to put something in bash profile. Bash RC is, is, is what you want. Um, bash profile has like a slightly different purpose. Um, that like in practice is going to work a lot of the times, but sometimes it won't. So that's my uh, lazy answer to that question since I don't remember all the details. So we are three minutes over uh, and I want to respect y'all's time. So um, I'm going to do the official wrap up here. Uh, and I'm just going to check my calendar. I have 30 minutes until my next meeting. So if y'all want to stick around and ask questions, I am here. Otherwise, peace out and enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. I will post this recording as soon as I get it uploaded to YouTube. Thanks so much.